introduce. I think uh, you know we have uh, uh, a couple of, uh, team members to uh, bring you an update on our transition from uh, Bombardier into De Havilland. And so De Havilland is very pleased to be here in Nashville with the RA as a full member of the RA once again uh, and as a standalone company. So in our uh, briefing today, we'll take you through uh, that uh, transition and uh, some of our plans for the U.S. market and uh, where we are going forward. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Todd Young, uh, C Chief Operating Officer of De Havilland Aircraft of Canada. Uh, myself, I'm Philippe Boutissou. I think I know most of you uh, from, uh, from previous uh, roles. Uh, I'm leading the sales and marketing at uh, De Havilland as the Vice President of Sales and Marketing. And uh, we also have with us uh, to assist in in questions and, and to uh, uh, explain some of the uh, activities we have ongoing, our Vice President of Engineering, Robert Mobilio. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Todd and uh, kick off the presentation. And of course, we'll take your questions at the end and uh, look forward to uh, discussing that with you. Okay, uh, thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in Nashville. Uh, I recall the RAA a number of years ago in Nashville. Nashville's changed so much, it's unbelievable, to be honest. Uh, so we've got uh, a brief presentation to give you. Uh, mine is very short, but I wanted to give you an update on some of the great things that we're doing under De Havilland Canada. Uh, we're really proud to be here at the RAA representing De Havilland Canada. And uh, of course, with De Havilland Canada coming back into the aerospace uh, community, uh, we're quite excited about that. So uh, before I get into my three slides, just talk about the transition, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, on June the 1st at 12.01, the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited came back into uh, the forefront for the Dash 8 turboprop market and business. Uh, so leading up to that point in time, uh, many of us were Bombardier employees and then at midnight, 1,200 people moved from Bombardier to De Havilland. So, you know, that all happened at one instance in time. Uh, we actually uh, rebadged all of the people, including myself. And on the Saturday morning, we became De Havilland employees. And, uh, you know, it's quite interesting. Uh, we were at Paris. Uh, I don't know if uh, any of you were at the Paris Air Show, but. Uh, we actually rolled out, uh, you know, the new company to Havilland, and uh, it was unbelievable the response we got. We so many people were excited about this brand coming back. So, uh, so we're really happy to be part of this uh, resurgence of this company. Of course, we're a Canadian company, and we're proud to be Canadian. We're proud to be part of the Canadian aerospace business. Uh, we are a private company now. Okay, so that's quite a bit different than what we were under Bombardier. So being a private company, you know, we don't have to report uh, specific things throughout the year. And uh, we have a bit more uh, flexibility and we're going to be more nimble in how we're able to manage uh, our marketplace uh, so that we can make sure we're building aircraft for many years to come. So let me just uh, go into how Longview Aviation Capital is uh, set up. And this works okay, good. So, so Longview Aviation Capital, it's basically uh, uh, a company that manages portfolios of long-term investments in the Canadian aviation industry. So there's five companies that uh, roll up under Longview. We, of course, we have uh, the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited now. Uh, we're just uh, around the 1,200 12, employee mark. Uh, Viking, so uh, Viking has 565 employees. And if we want to make a big distinction here. So the Havilland looks after just the Dash 8 family of turboprops. Viking takes care of all of the legacy type certificates, so DHC-1 up to DHC-7. 
Okay, so that's all the legacy de Havilland type certificates. Uh, Viking purchased those from Bombardier a number of years ago. They provide the support to all those aircraft. And of course, uh, Viking reintroduced the Twin Otter uh, into production. Uh, it's in production today. Uh, it's the DHC-6-400 series. Okay, so sometimes we get a bit confusing because we talk about Dash 400 and it's a Dash 8 400 or a DHC 6 Dash 400, but they are two different aircraft. Viking also, uh, most recently in 2016, purchased the CL 215 and 415 water bomber program from Bombardier as well. Uh, so, uh, so they're taking care of that uh, type certificate on top of all the legacy de Havilland aircraft. Then we have Longview uh, Aviation Asset Management uh, Group and Longview Aviation Services. So the Asset Management Group uh, takes care of leasing of aircraft and financing of aircraft. Uh, they are focused typically in the uh, Twin Otter business. Uh, aviation Services, uh, they actually uh, look at conversion activities. Uh, they're, they're actually working right now today on the CL215, 415 conversions. Uh, so Longview purchased a number of CL215 aircraft. Uh, they are working on converting those into CL415 water bombers. And then we have uh, Pacific Sky Aviation Inc. Uh, so this is a, a training center and a, a flight operations uh, a business for them. Again, focused on the Twin Otter business. They actually have a uh, simulator uh, in Calgary that uh, simulates obviously uh, the characteristics of a twin otter but very unique this simulator also uh, simulates landing with floats so it's the only simulator in the world that actually has this uh, characteristic and uh, the Longview and Viking uh, folks are quite proud of that and they have 40 45 employees so uh, so the one key thing to note is, uh, of course, that the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited business is the largest business in Longview's portfolio, uh, from obviously an employee base, but also uh, overall yearly revenue base. Okay. So the facility that we're in today, uh, the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited, uh, uh, is based in Toronto. Uh, so this is the, uh, you know, not the original De Havilland facility. This facility was uh, built in uh, 1957, I believe. Uh, and in fact, uh, the original facility uh, was, was right here. Uh, so that was back in uh, 1928 that the that, uh, Havillands came to uh, Canada and set up uh, their business. Uh, our facility right now is this uh, large facility right here. Okay, so as mentioned, Longview uh, took that type certificate uh, June 1st. Uh, we are actually uh, sharing that facility with Bombardier. So we have Bombardier uh, Aviation now, uh, which is what their name, uh, and the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited side by side in the same facility. Uh, and uh, we, we actually are a sub-lease to Bombardier. Bombardier holds the main lease uh, with the uh, PST uh, Corporation, and uh, we then sublease our space from Bombardier. Uh, the lease arrangement uh, <coughs> that we have, it's, uh, it's basically a three-year lease with two years of extension possible. Uh, so what that means for us is uh, we have uh, the right to stay at this facility until 2023. Okay, so, so we've got, uh, you know, a, about three and a half to four years of time uh, at this facility uh, to continue building aircraft. We are building the Dash 8 uh, 400 uh, here at this facility. Uh, we have uh, most of the 1,200 people reside at this facility, we got about uh, 800 employees are focused on the, the building and uh, uh, supporting of the uh, Dash 8 400. Uh, and then we have an aftermarket business that supports all of our Dash 8 family of airplanes, uh, which make up uh, approximately 400 uh, people. Okay, so, uh, so we, uh, 
We're quite excited about this. Uh, you see at the bottom of the slide, uh, over 90 years of heritage uh, in this business. We're quite proud of that. And we want to, uh, we want to build this business such that uh, we're building aircraft for many years to come. We have been very focused, uh, and I, I'm gonna do a little bit of a cross here because we were Bombardier, we're now de Havilland. We spent a lot of time in the last year doing some significant changes to the Dash 8400. Uh, late in 2018, we introduced the first 90 seat uh, Dash 8400 that went into service with SpiceJet. Uh, we're continuing to deliver aircraft to SpiceJet in that configuration. We also changed uh, in early 2019, we changed the type spec that we uh, go out and offer uh, when we meet a customer for the first time. So we used to have a 74 seat configuration, which was our basic aircraft. We've now changed that basic aircraft that we go to offer to an 82 seat uh, Dash 8400. Uh, we are focused on extra capacity. Phil's gonna talk about that uh, in his presentation. Uh, we've also spent time with uh, Explicit, uh, who is a French manufacturer of seats for aircraft. Uh, together, uh, we worked together. They certified uh, the new ultra lightweight uh, seat uh, that goes into our 90 seat uh, Dash 8400. We have those seats on display in the trade show, so if you're interested to see those seats, and our colleagues from Explicit are here to. Uh, talk to you about all the goodness those seats bring to, uh, to the aerospace business. Okay, so, uh, so we're quite happy about that development. Of course, right now, our whole focus is on stabilizing our business. We're still delivering aircraft. Uh, uh, I was asked a question earlier, are we still building aircraft? We are. Uh, we've got quite a heavy ramp up. Our backlog takes us out until uh, October of 2020. And uh, of course, we're focused on building more and more aircraft past that point. We also uh, continue with our uh, you know, worldwide customer support network that we established. Uh, so uh, I won't go into all the details here, but we, uh, when we did the transition from uh, Bombardier to De Havilland, of course, we were looking after only the uh, Dash 8 family of airplanes. So what we did was we strategically selected our global <coughs> presence based on where our installed base of aircraft are around the world. So uh, we maintain five regional support offices. So we have a regional support office in Munich, Germany, a regional support office in Johannesburg, South, South Africa, uh, Tokyo, Japan, Delhi, India, and Sydney, Australia. Okay, uh, of course we have our main headquarters in Toronto. Uh, all of the uh, customer support outside of the regional support offices is in Toronto. So we have a customer response center uh, that uh, runs 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And we uh, provide technical support and material support to all of our aircraft globally uh, in order to keep those aircraft uh, flying and um, keeping passengers moving. Okay, so, so we're, we're focused on uh, product support and we're focused on ensuring our customers are getting the most out of the Dash 8 that they uh, expect to get. This is our portfolio. Okay, so, uh, so of course, uh, I'll start from the bottom. We've got the Dash 8 100-200. Uh, maximum seating, 39 seats. We had uh, 404 orders for that aircraft. We delivered 404 aircraft. Dash 8 300, uh, 56 uh, seat, uh, maximum seat capacity. Uh, 267 orders for that aircraft. We delivered 267 aircraft. Uh, these two aircraft, of course, models are out of production now. Uh, so basically we are working on aftermarket support and parts and services for those aircraft. We did do a big program called the Life Extension Program. Uh, in fact, our name for it is the ESP, Extended Service Program. We, we offer a service bulletin uh, for the Dash 8100 and the Dash 8300. Uh, we can do a service bulletin for the Dash 8200, 
but where it is in its life right now, the demand for that is not needed, so uh, we're going to wait until uh, that aircraft gets to a point in time uh, that it needs this life extension. Uh, what the life extension does, it increases the useful life of the uh, aircraft uh, structure from 80,000 cycles to 120,000 cycles. Uh, Witteros was our launch customer for this. Uh, they now have a Dash 8 100 flying over 110,000 cycles in service today. Of course, uh, from a production point of view, our key focus is the Dash 8 400. So uh, maximum seating capacity, as mentioned, 90 seats. We have orders for 648. We've delivered 600 as of the uh, end of July. Uh, you probably saw our press release around the delivery to Ethiopian Airlines with our 600 uh, delivery of the Dash 8 400. Our key focus here is uh, obviously new aircraft production. Uh, we do all the aftermarket support uh, for this aircraft and uh, all the parts and services uh, for uh, this aircraft type. So we're really excited about it. And uh, I'm gonna now hand it over to Phil, who's gonna talk about all the good things that we have done and what we're doing uh, with the Dash 8 400 aircraft. So thank you. Thanks, Todd. So, uh, of course, the RAA uh, annual convention is a great opportunity to talk to our North American operators. We have a number of uh, operators who are members who are here. Um, but it's also uh, an opportunity to uh, discuss some of the uh, changes and improvements that we've been making on the Dash 8 and uh, ways in which the Dash 8 400 can be put into service uh, to help support the development of uh, airlines uh, in North America. Um, the footprint of the Dash 8 program in North America is, is very strong. A lot of it has to do with the, uh, obviously, the Canadian uh, presence and very, very strong customer base in Canada. Uh, but uh, when you combine Canada and the U.S., we have 350 aircraft of all series, Dash 8, 100, 200, 300, and 400 in service, uh, with some uh, very, very significant operators, particularly on the 400, uh, for example, Horizon Air, uh, RA member as well as Jazz uh, flying the Dash 8 400, uh, Porter, WestJet, um, a couple of very significant operators of the Dash 8 400 in, in this region. Uh, within the Dash 8 family, you also have quite a few aircraft that have been put into special mission roles and are operating either civil or, uh, in some cases, military missions uh, in, in specialized roles. So that's a, a testament to the versatility of the, uh, the Dash 8 family. So when we look at uh, the opportunity going forward for the Dash 8 program, obviously we're very focused on the uh, commercial air transport and the airline market. Uh, the Dash 8 400 uh, is primarily used in those uh, types of missions. Uh, but like the Dash 8 100, uh, 200 and 300, uh, the Dash 8 400 has had its uh, features and characteristics applied into other uh, mission types. So for example, in the center at the top, the uh, Dash 8 400 has been converted into a, a fire um, fighting aircraft as a, a, as a tanker. Uh, and in fact, we are uh, delivering new production aircraft to Conair of, uh, of Canada, uh, who are putting those in service uh, in, in Europe. Uh, there is also potential for the Dash 8 400 in uh, special mission roles in, uh, in, in government and military type operations. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a role that uh, the Dash 8 200 and 300 has excelled in. Uh, typical missions such as uh, multi-mission transport in, uh, in conflict zones or uh, uh, surveillance and maritime patrol roles. And uh, we do see potential for the Dash 8 400 with its additional capacity and, uh, and, and payload carrying uh, capability to, uh, to be used in those uh, types of roles. If we turn to the, uh, to, to the uh, commercial airliner market, which is the focus of the convention here, um, you know, the, the Dash 8 really stands out uh, among turboprops and, in fact, among regional airline, uh, regional aircraft because of uh, a few really key characteristics and, and drivers of airline business models. So, of course, CASM and uh, operating economics is uh, probably the fundamental KPI that uh, uh, aircraft evaluations uh, uh, consider 
uh, and uh, with the uh, ability to carry now up to 90 uh, passengers in the, in the Dash 8400, uh, what were already excellent economics of uh, a turboprop with the productivity of a jet have become even better when you look at the, uh, the chasm. Um, and then, of course, for the, uh, for the airlines, it's important to uh, have the support and uh, to have an aircraft that is reliable and, uh, and, and um, creates minimal disruption uh, in the event of, uh, of some kind of a, 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 an incident or anything on, in, in, um, in startup or, or in, uh, in service. And uh, that's an area that uh, Todd and, and, and Rob and the team at uh, de Havilland had been working on uh, quite extensively in ensuring that the aircraft maintains a very high rate of reliability. And so we're very proud that uh, uh, we have the, the Dash 8400 uh, operating uh, particularly the, the aircraft that uh, have been delivered recently are operating at very high levels of reliability. In fact, uh, one of the, the metrics we use, dispatch reliability, is running at about 99.5% for those recent delivery uh, aircraft. So, uh, you know, obviously prior to the transaction, the, the program was managed by Bombardier, but many of the team members, uh, the engineering team members, had moved across, and it's our intent to continue investing in the product and continue improving it. So some of the features that we offer to the market today have been uh, developed uh, around reliability, around improving the operating costs, and providing new capabilities on the aircraft, and that's something that we intend to take forward. Uh, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not at the stage where we will make uh, announcements today, but certainly uh, we will be with our with uh, the introduction of the explicit uh, aircraft as we've been able to not only uh, fit 90 seats uh, into the aircraft in a very comfortable manner, but take advantage of the reduced weight of those seats in order to, uh, to, to uh, recover uh, the ability to carry that payload for the extra passengers. And so with the 90-seat aircraft, uh, we are able to uh, offer the chasm of a, uh, of a large uh, single-aisle jet. And so uh, airlines such as um, a SpiceJet are using the Dash 8400 as a complementary aircraft to their uh, single-aisle fleet, uh, which allows them to access markets where the, the, the passenger volume uh, would not uh, be efficient to, to fly 170 or 180 seat aircraft. Uh, but at the same time, with a similar chasm, uh, they're able to, uh, to, to uh, market uh, those flights and those seats in, uh, in, a, in a similar way. So we, we think that uh, you know, this is uh, an aircraft type that uh, will be of interest to uh, airlines in, uh, in North America, particularly uh, with the development of low-cost carriers and now ultra-low-cost carriers. Uh, this is a tool that could be very effective for uh, shorter uh, haul flying or accessing smaller markets uh, with uh, that business model. Of course, uh, we also believe that the Dash 8400 still has a very important role to play in network carriers. Uh, in fact, uh, Horizon Air uh, uses the Dash 8400 on the West Coast as uh, a feeder to uh, Seattle and Portland as well as uh, to serve some point-to-point -point markets where uh, the stage length uh, makes the turboprop an unbeatable uh, solution uh, for those markets. Uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, with, with the aircraft being in service with uh, Air Canada, with Porter and WestJet, uh, it's uh, flying many missions in Canada, including uh, network hub feeding in, uh, in, in uh, Toronto's Pearson International Airport, Airport for uh, WestJet and Air Canada. Uh, and out of the uh, Toronto Billy Bishop Island Airport uh, with Porter, where they have their own uh, hub and spoke network uh, out of that downtown airport. And what we see in terms of the ways in which the uh, Dash 8400 is used by those airlines, obviously short haul flying is where turbo prop excels, uh, but because of the productivity of the aircraft, uh, the aircraft is also being used uh, either in complement to jets or uh, in fact, as the, uh, the aircraft that allows the airlines to access markets where jets would not be viable. So we, we, we do have the Dash 8400 in operation on routes uh, in excess of 600 nautical miles, flying uh, two, two and a half hour, in fact, even three hour segments uh, for those airlines. 
So some of the conversations we'll be having here with the RAA uh, members is uh, around some of the uh, opportunities in the US where of course uh, up gauging and scope clause and uh, all these other factors influence their uh, decisions around fleet. Uh, but uh, clearly in terms of capability, uh, the Dash 8400 is an airplane that can serve many of the missions for which uh, the, the regional carriers are called upon by the network carriers to, to serve. Um, and in fact, when we look at, um, uh, just as a sample here, we've shown the 50 seat uh, jet network out of Chicago. Now this is multiple carriers, <coughs> so it's not just one of the carriers, but uh, there are many, many routes that are still being flown by 50 seat jets either under an hour or under uh, two hours, and certainly within the range requirements uh, or the range capability of a Dash 8400. Uh, so with the, uh, with the uh, excellent operating cost of a Dash 8400, we think that uh, this is a product that uh, merits uh, 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 consideration, particularly as those 50 seat jets age and uh, as uh, they uh, come towards the uh, Placement timeline for uh, for the fleets. Now, uh, one of the uh, one, one of the aircraft that uh, is being introduced is a repurposed 70 seat jet uh, into the 50 seat market, and uh, we have uh, also looked at how a Dash 8 400 would perform in that uh, mission. So, uh, actually, uh, optimizing the cabin of the Dash 8 400 around a three class product with 50 seats in order to meet the scope clause requirements of some of the, uh, uh, the major carriers in the US. Uh, the Dash 8400 is compliant on the weight restrictions uh, that uh, the scope clauses uh, currently uh, have. Uh, and uh, when we configure the Dash 8400 with 50 seats, we're able to uh, not only offer an aircraft that has excellent operating economics or trip cost economics, uh, in fact, uh, trip cost economics that are on the order of 13% uh, better than those 50 seat jets. But uh, with the extra real estate in the aircraft, we're able to offer the services that the, uh, the, that the mainline carriers expect now uh, to introduce at the regional level. Things that you can't do on 50 seat jets, like have uh, onboard storage for uh, close to uh, one to one and a half times the number of passengers uh, on the airplane. Uh, bringing roller bags either through our bins or through uh, wardrobes that are introduced in the cabin. Uh, and in fact, when we compare that to the, uh, the, the 70 seat jet that's been uh, repurposed as a 50 seater, uh, the operating economics of the turboprop make that aircraft 25% more efficient on a, on a chasm basis. So uh, again, this is a, a concept that uh, we believe uh, could be of great interest to RA members and we'll be uh, discussing that and, uh, and, and sharing some of the concept LOPAs with those customers uh, during the, uh, the meetings uh, in the next couple of days. So uh, just in, uh, in conclusion, I guess uh, we are very, very pleased to be back uh, at the RA with our single focus being on the Dash 8 and the uh, development of the Dash 8 family and the Dash 8 400 in particular and taking this program into the future. Uh, we have a, a, a very attractive product that has uh, a versatile uh, applications in, uh, in many uh, airline as well as uh, non-airline applications. And uh, it's something that uh, we're very excited and uh, as Todd reminds me every day, we wake up every morning thinking about Dash 8s. We don't uh, get distracted by any other aircraft types. So with that, uh, happy to take your questions and uh, look forward to a great RAA with all of you. Thank you. Hey, Luke, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, APR has, in the recent years, had about 80% of the new order backlog. You've got a very big uphill to climb to regain market share. Just how are you going to do that? Well, so, so uh, you know, the, the, the numbers are the numbers, and, uh, you know, there, there were uh, obviously uh, you know, other factors at the time, but the fact that uh, we're very focused on the Dash 8400. Uh, we have put in place a commercial team that uh, not only covers uh, this market here, but we have uh, uh, hired and uh, in some cases uh, transitioned 
team members from the uh, from the Bombardier sales team have joined the Havlet. We let to join the Havlet, and uh, we'll be speaking to customers throughout the world. Uh, the, the the ATR and the Dash 8 obviously get lumped together uh, in, in many people's minds as, as uh, the turboprop or the large turboprop segment. Um, the, uh, the aircraft themselves have uh, some different characteristics, uh, and in particular, the Dash 8 400 uh, excels in terms of its payload carrying capacity and its productivity because of the combination of the aircraft performance and, and the payload. And so we believe that there are um, many airlines that will be uh, looking to uh, take advantage of that. And uh, there are uh, situations where clearly the Dash 8 400 uh, offers them um, capability that, uh, that they can't necessarily get out of the competing product. So uh, we're going to compete for, uh, for business. And uh, we believe that uh, with the product and with the focus on the Dash 8 400, with our international presence, as uh, Todd mentioned, that was set up on day one, uh, through our RSOs as well as our commercial team, uh, that uh, the Dash 8 400 will be a very competitive force against the ATR. Philippe, have you uh, focused on the Russian or Chinese markets, which were sort of the gap when we looked at your map of where your customers are? Uh, so, so, good question. I think uh, you know maybe I'll give my, my colleagues a chance to uh, discuss what we've done in, in Russia and, and in China in the past. But uh, certainly those are important markets that require the uh, characteristics that the Dash 8 400 offers. Um, you know, some very challenging performance, uh, remote region operations, something that the Dash 8 uh, does extremely well. Uh, there is an installed base of Dash 8 400s in Russia. Uh, and uh, you know, like every other market uh, where we see opportunity, we'll carry on conversations uh, within the, the, the bounds of, uh, you know, obviously, political and, and jurisdictional restrictions that, that there may be, but uh, certainly we are open to working with Russian uh, operators uh, and similar with Chinese operators. Uh, we have a commercial team uh, that has been assigned to cover those regions and uh, we will uh, be present uh, in those markets and if there are opportunities for the Dash 8 and the Dash 8 400, we certainly will compete there. Yeah, so uh, Russia, China, to be honest, these are uh, very important markets for us. Uh, they, they were looked at uh, a number of years ago uh, within the Bombardier organization. Uh, for the Dash 8 400, of course, uh, the two markets themselves are similar, but they're quite different at the same time. Uh, so in Russia, uh, as Phil said, uh, we do have an installed base of aircraft that are flying in Russia's CIS. Uh, we, we actually are still delivering aircraft into the CIS portion. Uh, Russia has become a bit more challenging because of some of the uh, government sanctions that uh, got invoked uh, a number of years ago. And uh, we, you know, each day we, we think of ways how we can, you know, work within the realms of those uh, sanctions. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the Dash 8 400 to go into Russia. Uh, we actually believe it can be a significant uh, aircraft of impact for that region. We just have to figure a way to get it into the Russian market and, uh, you know, us stay compliant with all of those rules that uh, are in front of us. China, on the other hand, uh, is a bit different uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there is a, an aircraft that's being designed in China, so so there's a bit of a, a, you know push out from China as far as letting uh, you know call it North American products to go into China to actually capture a market that they're going to try to capture with their own product. Uh, so we we uh, we recognize that challenge and we recognize for us the the only way we're going to get into China is through partnering with somebody who's in China today. So either a company or an organization that wants to partner with us and make some kind of inroads uh, through the government uh, of China. Uh, but the good news now, uh, and I'll say it to Phil again, but uh, we wake up every day thinking about how we can move Dash 8 400s uh, all over the world. So uh, even last night we were talking to one of our possible partners about China. 
So, um, you know, we're interested in both markets. Uh, we got to be very strategic in how we go about doing it. Uh, but uh, we see a possible big demand for turboprops in both those regions. Thank you. When you say partners, do you mean commercial partner or manufacturing partner? And it could yes. be either or, to be honest. Uh, in, and if you followed Bombardier, we were actually looking at uh, partner commercial and manufacturing. Uh, one thing we will not do is we will not do any manufacturing anymore uh, without an order for airplanes. Because <laughs> we've done that in the past and it, it hasn't rewarded us at all. So, you know, we, we want to, you know, create a win-win for everybody that would be involved in that partnership, including us. So to that end, as you kind of scale your production line, I do feel like you have ready workforce Uh, so, if I understand the question correctly, so our workforce right now is uh, able and ready. It's very seasoned, very experienced building Dash 8 uh, 400s. Uh, just to give you an idea, we moved 1,200 people. Uh, these people, in many cases, had choices. Uh, they didn't have to go to De Havilland. They all wanted to go to De Havilland. Uh, of course, you're leaving Bombardier to go to a new company. So. You know, you have to make sure you're looking after your own personal interests. So, you know, in some cases there were some discussions uh, around what this would all mean for uh, each individual. Uh, but people chose to go to uh, De Havilland. Uh, we still believe uh, we can increase our employee base. Uh, not a problem. Uh, if we increase or scale up our production rates. Uh, so we're, we're quite comfortable. We're, we're really quite comfortable. We have a complete engineering organization that has the capability and capacity to design airplanes now. So that was one of the key things as part of our transition from Bombardier was uh, obviously appointing Rob as our, our uh, you know, vice president of engineering, uh, but also building a complete uh, uh, design approval organization or design approval or design, uh, the EAO, design approval organization that has the wherewithal to manage the continuing airworthiness of the business, but also we, we took the approach that we wanted to make sure we could also build, design new airplanes if we saw that need in the future. So we have uh, complete capacity to do everything. Yes? Uh, this would be for Todd, I think. Um, one of the uh, complaints that I would hear about the P400 versus APR is the capital cost. Obviously, Bombardier had a cost issue with building the airplane. What are you doing to bring out costs or the capital cost of the customer? Yeah, so so uh, there there is a there is a gap uh, in you know the, the the acquisition cost of a Dash A four hundred to an ATR. Uh, of course, we believe the value proposition is such that uh, an operator that chooses a Dash A four hundred will see that return. Uh, uh, many times over, over the, the life of the aircraft uh, due to its productivity, as Phil mentioned. Uh, that being said, of course, we are constantly looking at ways to reduce uh, what we call our unit cost, uh, which in turn, if we can reduce our unit cost, then it allows us to offer more attractive pricing for the aircraft. Uh, today, uh, you know, one of our big focuses is on uh, there's really two pieces of the cost uh, for this aircraft. One is the bill of material, uh, and we are heavily uh, uh, supplier supported uh, on the bill of material. Uh, and the other is the labor portion to, to build what we do in Toronto. Okay, uh, so of course we have uh, our own plans to continue to reduce uh, the number of hours it takes to do our labor content. Uh, at the same time, we, we have and uh, we are uh, reaching out to our suppliers to see uh, what contribution they can provide to us uh, as far as the cost of the components and uh, uh, systems that we buy on the market today. But those are the two components that we have to uh, you know, focus on in order to allow Phil to sell these aircraft at attractive pricing. Bertie, you had a question? I was actually on supply chain, um, so I think Todd picked up, picked up on it. I mean, basically, I was, I was going to say what, what, um, not, what, how extensive you've gone through talking to all the suppliers, and are there potential uh, uh, 
switch out switch in uh, things happening because I mean obviously you say you like it you're looking to, to get um, the bill of material down um, anything that you've got coming up in that where not only, I suppose not only for the, for the bill but also maybe for um, some extra performance yeah so it's a, it's a great question so uh, right now today our supply chain uh, network uh, remains unchanged uh, with the exception of the fact that with the uh, change of ownership, uh, Bombardier becomes a supplier to De Havilland. Okay, so uh, under the Bombardier uh, ownership, uh, we, were, we were having our sister companies uh, support us. So Belfast uh, facility made parts for the Dash 8400. Carretera Mexico was making parts for the Dash 8400 and components. Uh, those two facilities now are suppliers to De Havilland, okay? And they are uh, being treated as suppliers, not as sister companies. Uh, De Havilland, of course, maintains, uh, you know, the work that was in the Toronto facility. So we continue to build the cockpit, we continue to build the wing for this aircraft. We also have our fabrication shops that make many parts for the aircraft. Uh, the rest of the supply chain is the same. Of course, uh, you know, we announced at Paris our partnership with Explicit. Uh, so we are always looking at opportunities to uh, reduce costs, but also bring big value to the aircraft. So, and we will continue to do that. As far as uh, swapping suppliers, uh, you know, we're, we're in our 13th week of ownership of this uh, new business. So uh, uh, our first focus, to be very frank about it, is uh, we have to stabilize the business. You know, uh, it it's a, was a daunting task to transition uh, from Bombardier, uh, which was a very complex, highly integrated uh, uh, company from an organization perspective. We actually broke and carved out all of the functions that supported the Dash 8 uh, program and put them into the Havilland. So uh, that was a massive undertaking. And, uh, you know, one of the, the real things that we are really happy about uh, is that in all of the customers that we have met uh, thus far in those 13 weeks, uh, they have been pleasantly surprised that there has been no disruptions to their operations from the Havilland. So we hit the ground running on June the 1st. Uh, we were uh, receiving uh, uh, requests for either support or parts. Uh, we were delivering airplanes right out of the gate. Uh, and uh, the, the actual airline base was shocked that we were able to do that. So our first thing, and it doesn't mean that everything's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We, can, we do have some issues, but uh, we're making sure those issues are not jeopardizing our airline's operations. Uh, and uh, so when I say stabilize the business, we got to stabilize some of the things that are uh, in the background uh, that's uh, taking place. Uh, I talked about the engineering organization. We had to build an engineering organization. We had to build a supply chain group. Uh, supply chain was managed out of Montreal. Uh, we moved the entire supply chain function from Montreal to Toronto with no people. So we actually had to hire an entire supply chain team. So we had to transfer contracts from Montreal. We had to transfer the actual issues because they're. With everything you do, you have issues. So there's claims that were open that we had to pick up and start to manage. Uh, we had a basically a green organization of people. They, they had supply chain experience, but they did not have the Havilland Dash 8 contract experience. So uh, they, they had to start from scratch on that front. So uh, uh, our HR team was integrated across Bombardier. We built our own HR team. Our finance team uh, was integrated. We built our own finance team. So, you know, all of those things uh, we, we had to put in place to be ready for June 1st. And of course, as uh, June 1st came and went, uh, uh, our focus was to make sure we could deliver aircraft, which we did. We had to transfer uh, the type certificate, which is very easy to do, actually. It's just a, a change of an issue of the type certificate and a signature from Transport Canada. but the stuff that goes behind that to allow them to transfer the type certificate. Uh, we had to get the DAO approved. 
by Transport Canada. So Rob and I spent uh, countless hours on the phone and in face-to-face -face meetings with Transport Canada. Uh, we had to get a manufacturing license for the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited. We had to establish an approved MRO uh, for the Havilland Aircraft of Canada Limited. And without the manufacturing license, without the MRO approval, we would not have been able to deliver aircraft. So uh, all that was put in place before June 1st. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we had a sales organization that we had to build, and I'm really happy that Bill uh, decided to come back to our company. Uh, he was with us, as many of you know, uh, for many, many years. And uh, I think we got the right person in the role of uh, sales and marketing to lead the charge for us. And, uh, you know, our objective is to uh, build a solid backlog and uh, uh, build aircraft for many years to come. Thanks for that, John. I think uh, conscious of the time, so I uh, probably have another one. I want to maybe take one last question, and uh, we're obviously here for the next uh, 48 hours, so if there's any other conversations you'd like to have, we can uh, schedule those. So, uh, John, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, the, the CRJ 550 comparison to the CRJ 550, obviously the CRJ 550 is driven by the fact that there are a fixed number of shells allowed in the United States. And given you know, how additionally creative do you have to be, not just beyond the ability to do a LOPA for uh, to keep 150 seats, but also figure out what to do with making room for those air those airplanes to begin with. Obviously, the seas for Embraer air and the atmosphere on the CRJ side. I mean, how how do you? I mean, it's not just that. I mean, how do you kind of do that balance? Yeah. So I I, I think uh, the, the the underlying Numbers for the, uh, the the 50 seat replacement in the U.S. are quite significant. So there's, uh, you know, I, I have to look up the exact number for you, and I can get that. But uh, let's say there's on the order of six or seven hundred 50 seat jets uh, still in service in the U.S. Uh, were you to uh, introduce, uh, you know, the, the 550 concept on every single CRJ 700 airframe uh, and put those into the U.S., you'd still fall short. In terms of the replacement, now you know, of course, there are other OEMs that are out there uh, selling new product, and obviously they have an ability to deliver new product. There's potential changes in the scope rules uh, that, that come. So these are all things that we need to monitor. Uh, but we definitely think that there is a, a gap in the supply of 50 seat replacement aircraft, and uh, the airlines are going to have to get creative, and in some cases adjust their business models in order to. Uh, replace that flying uh, over time. Yeah, sure. the, so the, the knock on of that is, is you've got to do an, another education program to convince the flying public that it's a jet and not a, and not a piston. <laughs> Thanks no. for the suggestion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a great point because that, that is something we are going to have to do. Mm. Uh, so you've got the, the jet versus turboprop question. The other thing that's coming front and center at all of us uh, not necessarily as quickly in North America, but in Europe, the whole environmental aspect of uh, uh, aircraft and becoming more uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, the Dash 8400 actually uh, right now is an environmentally friendly aircraft, and we have to promote that as part of the old value proposition uh, for the airplane. Uh, we, we truly believe that uh, uh, there's big opportunities uh, on that front, and. Uh, uh, we're, we're actually working with a number of airlines in Europe because Europe is uh, really going hard and fast on, you know, what is the environmental characteristics of that product. So we'll take that as well into the North American marketplace as a, a value proposition of why a turboprop brings enhanced value over and above just jet versus prop. Yeah, well, sorry. I one last, one last question. I, I was also going to ask about safety seats. Okay. Sure. Well, in that case. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you have another one behind this, so, so somebody else is going to come into this room at some point. <laughs> right. But anyway, um, variously, you had mentioned the, the, the idea about performance improvement programs and new airplane programs. Embraer is looking at a brand new turboprop. If John Slattery mm -hmm. had his way, he'd already be doing it, but the Boeing over Angus cast a shadow over that. Uh, Philip, uh, 
Uh, many years ago, you wrote in an article about the challenges of building and uh, designing a new turbo prop. What's your view on that, the Embraer possibility and the possibility, uh, either Rob or Doc, of re-engineering the P-400? So, so, well, clearly you, you, you've been following and monitoring <laughs> these developments for, for a while. And, and I think, uh, you know, the first thing I would say is the fact that uh, there's another OEM interested in building a large turboprop suggests that there is demand for that airplane. And, and certainly that's something that, uh, that we believe. Um, you know, there's many different ways to skin a cat. And uh, certainly with uh, having one of the leading products in service with the uh, potential to continue to evolve, is a good position to be in, and that's uh, you know some of the things that that uh, Robert's been looking at in terms of what can we do to uh, improve the Dash A400 over time. It's it's clear that there are uh, new types coming in the jet uh, category in this space. Uh, you know, the other audience are here talking about their future products, and we know that uh, we're going to have to stay competitive on that on that end. Um, the the other point you referred to was you know how hard is it to bring a, a turboprop to market. Uh, that article was really focused on the lower end of the market, uh, the, the 37 to 50 seat, where our Dash 8, uh, 100, 200, and 300 uh, currently serve the market. Uh, and that is a, a, a question that we often get, is, uh, you know, are you gonna put the aircraft back into production? Um, the, the, there are some very particular challenges with that, um, and not the least of which is the expectation from the market as to the cost of one of those airplanes. So uh, in order to, to, to put that aircraft back into production and put it in service and sell it at a price that the operators are able to, uh, to absorb is a, is a very significant challenge. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, that's why our focus on keeping the Dash 8 100, 200 ecosystem healthy and supporting those operators and keeping those aircraft flying for a very long time through the ESP program is, uh, is, is the first line of defense in that market. Uh, but uh, you know, as we stabilize the business, we'll look at, uh, at, at where the other opportunities are for the Dash 8 family and, and how it should evolve uh, according to the market demand. And, and we're gathering that input every day from, uh, from the customers we're speaking to. Yeah, and uh, to add to, to what Phil has commented on, uh, you know, we get asked every time we meet somebody, doesn't matter whether it's an airline, whether it's a supplier, whether it's media, uh, you know, are you going to put the classics back into production? Uh, our response to that is we're, we're evaluating, okay? We are evaluating what to do. Uh, so we have a lot of options in front of us. So we, we have the ability to say, you know, put the classic back into production, which is a big task. Uh, you know, that uh, an aircraft that was designed uh, almost 30 years ago now. Uh, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of things that would have to be updated on the uh, configuration of that aircraft in order to make it attractive in the market today. Uh, we also have the Dash 8 400. So uh, uh, you know, when we designed that aircraft, uh, that aircraft was designed with the potential to stretch it. It was designed with the potential to shrink it. So we have that option available as well. Uh, so, uh, so we've got lots of uh, good things in front of us to uh, review, debate, and, and look at. And uh, we are you know, now under our new ownership. We are now in a position that we're, we're able to look at those kind of things. Uh, with respect to re-engineering, uh, we, we had been looking at uh, you know, a re-engine, uh, a new engine for uh, the Dash 8400. We, we had been talking to many engine suppliers on that. Uh, the one key area that's now, you know, a bit of concern uh, is what's the uh, disruptive technology that's coming in the future? Uh, so the hybrid engine, you know, hybrid electric engine, uh, Rob's team's working uh, with uh, an engine manufacturer right now, uh, looking at, you know, what is possible from a concept point of view and, uh, and a demonstrator point of view. The, the key in all of that is, you know, how long does that technology take to get to market? Uh, and then what do we do while we're waiting for that new technology to be available? Okay, and uh, it is exciting though, because, uh, you know, being part of this uh, disruptive technology that's uh, gonna change the shape of the future and really drive 
uh, my whole comment around uh, becoming more environmentally friendly uh, is going to be exciting times for the industry, and uh, we're excited to be part of it. It's going to be more fun. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you've got it right on, and then also working with a lot of our, uh, of our customers, uh, in particular in Europe and in, in Norway, that uh, you know, some of the, the announcements out of Norway as well, in terms of having like a fully electric aircraft by 2040, and there's some very aggressive supply lines there. So over the course of these weeks that we've been together, especially at the Paris Air Show, having those discussions with uh, not only the engine manufacturer, but with, uh, with our customers as well. Well, so it's in Israel. We have not been involved uh, with Widerow and Rolls-Royce together. Uh, we have spoken to Widerow. Yeah. I think we'll, uh, we'll cut it off there, but as I said before, feel free to uh, make an appointment or come by our booth. Definitely come and try out the Explicit, uh, because we do have it at the booth. You can sit in it and experience the, uh, the comfort of a lightweight seat. Ultra and, lightweight. Uh, ultra ultra lightweight. lightweight. <laughs> And uh, look forward to a uh, very successful RA for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.